Good afternoon, you all. We're back to Nook Chat. We have a very unusual guest today, not one who spent all of her life in the Nooksack Valley, but this is a gal who spent a great uh, entertaining world. She's been out in a world that most of us never have experienced, and so I'm very excited about hearing all about what goes on inside the world of entertainment. And I'm going to introduce her as Diane Dauncey, because that was her stage name as well as her maiden name. So people who might be watching this on YouTube around the world might remember her as Diane Doncey. And uh, uh, we're gonna have, I'm going to have her start where she was born over on Vancouver Island. So Diane, take it away. Okay. I was born on Vancouver Island in Royston in 1927. So that puts me 90 years old. <laughs> and uh, my mother was a, a nurse at one time, but she retired when she married, and my father was a lumberjack. He was a tree topper, and he was killed in an accident on Vancouver Island when I was three years old. So my mother decided she was got to earn a living. So she took her certificates that she'd earned in England, and she applied in New York City, and she got to be a nurse in Bellevue Hospital, and they took her out. So we moved when I was very young, about five years old, to New York. And that's where I was brought up mostly, in New York. And we lived, when I was a teenager in New York, we lived in, uh, on Riverside Drive, and we had an apartment house that was owned by a, a very theatrical musical family, and they were the owners of the apartment house. And the gentleman, the, uh, the older gentleman, was first a, a trumpeter for Tuscanini's orchestra. So I got a chance to go to Carnegie Hall and listen to some of the music they'd take me to see, or I'd go listen to the rehearsals of the Philharmonic. So I think that's where my, my love of music came in. So I would go and listen to the operas and all kinds of crazy things, and finally I got into it. So my mother says, well, if you want to be in music, she says, you've got to learn dancing and you've got to learn music. So she put me with Paganucci as a singer, the coach singer, and he was an Italian, which I learned, and he worked at Carnegie Hall. So I took my voice lessons from him. And then I went to Pacheffi to do the flap ballet and the modern dance. So that's why I said, I want to do singing and dancing, because I figured out if I need a singer, I'm a singer. If they need a dancer, I'm a dancer. So that's a better chance to do two things. So that's what I did, and I studied. Well, I got to do a lot of musicals during the 50s. I worked in Carousel and Oklahoma and uh, King and I and things like that, and they were fun. I worked in the chorus and dancing, and then I did the marriage. So mostly in the 50s, I did musicals. And then in the 60s... Let's, let's okay. start with this. Then. Okay. She was headlining up at the Grouse Mountain Chalet. And uh, some of, if anybody remembers the old chalet, the old log chalet up on Grouse Mountain, she was headlining there in 53 as Diane Doncey. So anybody was there? And this is what she looked like then. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the chalet, which, as we uh, found out later, burned down, so... It was a beautiful place. They used to serve tea in the afternoon on the banister, and then at night they had dinner by candlelight with Reggie Shaw's orchestra and piano. And it was a very nice, uh, comfortable thing. I was quite disappointed when I found out how it burnt down and nobody <laughs> told me what happened to it. But anyway, that was things. So I did that. I enjoyed that. And what else did I do? Let's see, the 60s. Then you were in the 60s, you said you went... Uh... I turned and went into the... TVs in the 60s, and I did pilot films in that. And the pilot film is when you make a series, and if the, the uh, sponsor likes it, then he'll buy the, buy the film, and they'll make a series out of it. So I was happened to be the this pilot one. film for, this has, no, it's for Traffic this. Court and uh, here. Divorce Court, and I did The Rebel with John, uh, I think The Rebel thing is in there. No, Nick Adams. Nick Adams was the star of The Rebel, and we did the pilot film for that. It was taken over, and he was very kind enough to send me a nice birthday card saying, thank you for the TV show, Diane. We did it. <laughs> so he was, was a very nice... The pilot? No, that's the, no, that is Carousel. That's the scenes that's in Carousel. Carousel. Yeah, that's the U.S. show. Okay, I guess I don't have it right here. But anyhow, go on. Okay. 
So I did the pilot films, and I enjoyed doing those pilot films because there were different things we get. And I did the traffic court was a pretty, I don't know, it was a good one, but they turned out that the pilot film, they did put on the TV, and I didn't think it was going to go on TV, but it was the first show with traffic, so I got good residual checks for that because you don't get a residual check, check if you do a pilot film. So I got that, and then I decided, well, I had fun doing pilot films, but then by accident I got into doing some modeling. So I did for Bothwell Cars, the Adelaide, and you got this picture in there for the That's Bothwell The models cars. are down here, <laughs> I think. I don't know. Yeah, these are the modeling pictures. Yeah. Well, the Bothwell car one, I think. And he had beautiful cars, that old-fashioned cars. So I did modeling for things. So for, because I did the Bothwell cars, they had the Pan Pacific Auto Show down in California, and I got to be the Ford hostess for the Ford company. So I had quite a good time doing the Ford hostess company. I don't know if that's in there. But it was fun, anyway, doing that. And then I decided to myself, well, I'm doing the pilot films. And I'm doing it in the last film I did was Ripley's Believe It or Not was the man who stole the Mona Lisa. And there are scenes in here from the on the, on the set of the Mona Lisa that we did that would be interesting for people to see looking around. And I did that. Well then towards the seventies my husband says, Well, he was an executive for Western Airlines, so he did a lot of traveling around the world. So he says, How about if we kind of retire together and we can go around the world and do different trips if you'd like. So he's starting to retire. And I said, well, why are you retiring? He says, well, Howard Hughes wants to buy the company. And if he buys the company, I'm out of a job. So sure enough, Howard Hughes bought Western Airlines and he fired the whole crew and brought in his own crew. So my husband decided then I'm going to start retiring. So he went to work for a while for a company called Stainless Steel that made the boosters for the rockets that sent the rockets up into the space. And he did pretty good on that. And then we decided we were going to travel. So we said, okay, let's travel. So we had some funny times traveling. So we went different places. And when he had the, uh, when he had the company of Western Airlines, he was building hangars for the Western Airlines and the different companies. So we traveled to different countries and we do different things. And one thing about traveling with my husband, he spoke five different languages. He was born in Holland. His mother spoke French and Frisian. So, and he, he spoke Ita uh, Italian, and he also spoke German because he went to school in Germany. His father was a professor taught in engineering in Berlin University. And he, he invented the powdered yeast for Fleischmann Company. His, uh, so my father-in-law did. And uh, Fleischmann was the one that bought the family over from Germany over to this country. So every time we went traveling, somebody would come up to me and they'd say, do you speak Dutch? And I'd say, no, but he does. And then he said, okay, then he'd translate. Then they'd come up to me and they'd say, oh, do you speak Italian? No, I don't, but he does, you know, and then he'd translate. Finally, an English couple came up and they said, excuse me, do you speak English? I'd say, no, but he does. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this kind of odd things that were going on. So I felt kind of silly about that. But then one time I, I was doing modeling towards about, I think it was in the 60s, early, late 60s, early 70s. I started doing a lot of modeling for cold bathing suits. I did the cold bathing suits. And I did Julie Lynn Charlot. And we used to do the, the modeling for them. But I had a good time doing those, those shows too because they were pretty good on the thing. But while I was doing that, I had M.A. Mansour, who was an Egyptologist that I was working for. And this Egyptologist had a shop that he sold Egyptian things in, but he also received stuff from different museums that were going. So we were unpacking things that came from Egypt and distributing them to different museums throughout the country. So one day, I was sitting in the shop all by myself, it was on Wilshire Boulevard, and they said, we're going to go next door and get coffee, Diane. The monsieur and I said, okay. They said, we'll be back in about 10 minutes. I said, fine. So they went out, and I was sitting there doing the work, and these two gentlemen came in. One stood at the door, and the other one came in, and I said, uh-oh, I think I'm going to be robbed. I thought, you know, because this tall guy stood at the doorway. So he came in, and he said, excuse me. He says, is Mr. Monsieur here? And I said, no, he's out for coffee right now, but he'll be back in a few minutes. 
And they said, okay. And he said, do you mind if I wait? I said, no. And I said, gee, he's dressed oddly for Southern California. Wore me had a suit on and a tie and a blur or a hat. And I said, okay. So I looked and I said, well, if he's going to sit here. And I went and got a chair out of the office. And I put the chair down. And I said, I took his elbow and I said, please sit down in the chair. And well, you'll be back in a minute. So when I took his elbow to put him in the chair, the gentleman in the door made a move towards coming in. And he shook his head like this, and I said, gee, that's funny. So I sat him down in the chair anyway, and I said, okay. So about five minutes, ten minutes later, the monsoors came in. The minute they came in, they started jabbering away in Arabic. And I said, oh boy, yeah, they know him from Arabic, somewhere from Egypt or somewhere. So they said, Diane, do you want to go get a cup of coffee? And I said, yeah. So I went out to get a cup of coffee, and when I came back in about 10 or 15 minutes, he was gone, and he said, gee, what did you do to him? He sure took a fancy to you. Well, I was 19 at the time. He said, he sure took a fancy to you. And I said, oh? And he said, yeah. And he said, he wanted to know where you were born and how old you were and everything. I said, and he says, what did you do? And I said, nothing. I said, he asked if he could stay, and I just took his arm and sat him in your chair. He said, oh, no, you took his arm and sat him in the chair? I said, yes. And he says, He's this crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and women don't touch him. <laughs> and I said, oh, dear. I said, that's why. That was his bodyguard that was at the door. And I guess when I touched him, he moved in. Uh, so it kind of scared me. And he said, he's coming back tomorrow. And I said, he's coming back tomorrow. And I said, I won't be at work tomorrow. I'll be coming in the next day. So I didn't go back in the next day. I was kind of afraid. <laughs> so I don't know why. But that was another experience I had that was fun. I enjoyed working for Mr. Mansour, when I left him finally, I, he, they went back to Egypt, and I said, okay. But I did do some modeling for him, because uh, Mr. Onik came in from Cairo, and he wanted to sell King Farouk's jewelry, and it was going on auction on Wilshire Boulevard. So when they went on auction, I asked him if, um, he said, well, we have this diamond necklace that has to go in auction. And I said, uh oh, no. And he says, yeah. So he says, Diane, he said, you have to take it home. And so we'll do it tomorrow morning and take pictures of it. Well, I was afraid to death to take this diamond necklace home. It's not in here. It's not in there. It might be in the other book then, probably. Anyway. So I slept with it under my pillow all night because I was afraid it was going to get robbed. <laughs> I said, well, who would know that I had it? But it, it was a. a Quite a diamond necklace, and we did quite a few of his his stuff that, that was sold at auction. And Miss Joni gave me a, a very nice combination letter, thanked me for doing the auction for him, for modeling it. And it, when I left them, they gave me a beautiful scarab bracelet that was all engraved on the inside, and it was an old one. That's the necklace, the diamond necklace. She said it's worth over a million dollars. <laughs> Yeah, he had some quite some nice things, but it scared me. What year was that? Uh, let's see, that was in probably in the 50s, I guess. Uh, I think it was, it was the year that King Farouk uh, abandoned the throne and went to Italy. So you say a million dollars then, not now? No, probably then. Right. It was solid diamonds. It, it scared the life out of me, that did. And they had some emerald stuff, too, and everything. But they took pictures and they sold it at auction. Ames Auction Gallery, I think, was the one that went on the celery on that. But anyway, that's what I did. You said you did some USO stuff. That's a USO. That's a uh, thing. We did some different shows for the USO. And we had a, a little Hawaiian girl there that I used to do. A, I can do Polynesian dancing, and I did a lot of that. I think the church saw me do one. They got me to do a dance for them at the church one time, and I did. But it was funny. We wore, when we went on the, I took over the spot because one of the girls couldn't do the Hawaiian dance, she, and we were short. So I said, okay. So I took her skirt. Well, the skirt at that time we had was cellophane. And the more we did the Tahitian, the faster we went, the more of the, of the cellophane we lost on the floor. So the boys kept saying, keep them going, girls, boys, because the more they dance, the less they're going to wear. <laughs> so we had a big pile of cellophane on the floor. But they, we had good trips on that, yeah. And we have the Bothwell cars. Hmm? The Bothwell cars, that's the Both picture of the Bothwell. This one? No, that one there. This one. Yeah. This was the Bothwell cars that we had. Ken. 
I did some modeling for the old time Bothwell cars and the modeling, and they had this one of the little cars that they had. Believe it or not, that car worked. <laughs> you did some voiceover work too for the movies. The what? Voiceover. Oh, yes. Um, during the Ten Commandments, uh, Henry Wilcoxon mostly completed the Ten Commandments picture because Mr. DeMille was very sick at that time, and if I think he died shortly after the Ten Commandments was made, not too long afterwards. But he had to complete the picture, so he did it. So one day, my, dr my drama teacher that I had in Hollywood was, uh, she was a very fine stage actress, and Samord Feely was her name, and she was a close friend of Mr. DeMille. In fact, Mr. DeMille gave me my SAG card, and there's SAG card, I, have a, I brought the SAG card and the AFRA card in case somebody wanted to see it. So how the cards looked. But anyway, he called Mr. DeMille in one day. You can pass those around. Into the cards. Take, you can pass them around. They may they like to see what they look like. And he called them in, and he said, Mr. Wilcoxon said, Mr. DeMille, I think you want to see the rushes on this picture that we just finished. And they said, uh-oh. And they said, what scenes were they? So he came in, and he sat in the room. Now, the rushes are the films that you do during the day, and then at night you go into the projection room and you look at them and you see if they're okay and if you want to do them or not. So he came in and the first thing he looked and he watched it and it, we were all, I wasn't there, but Maud told me that they were all sitting there watching Mr. DeMille real closer and he says, oh good God, he said, he said, we can't have that. He said, that has to be all refilmed over. And they said, no, it can't be refilmed over. We were wondering if we could dub the voices in over it. It turns out that he picked very Jewish-looking girls for the Ten Commandments and for the scene, and every one of them had a thick Brooklyn accent. <laughs> and he says, that'll never do. Brooklyn wasn't even there at the time of Moses, so he said, we're going to have to change all that. So they changed all that, and they redub it. So Maud called me in, and she says, we're dubbing voices this week, Diane. Would you like to come and do it? I said, I sure would. So I went in to do it, and that was one of the biggest checks I think I ever got. I think I got a $7,000 check for doing that week. <laughs> so I was very happy with that, and we did that. But that was another funny thing in the Ten Commandments, that all these girls had to be dubbed. It was this, I think it was the scene where the angel of death comes and puts the marking on the doors and goes through, and the people inside were talking. Well, some of those voices were the dubs we dubbed over. We dubbed over some of the marketplaces dubbing, but it was kind of funny to... Here, Mr. DeMille, he says, oh, good Lord. He says, Brooklyn wasn't even there when Moses was there. <laughs> so it was kind of funny that he had to change it up. But Mr. DeMille did a very good job. He did not get credit for it. Mr. DeMille got the credit for the Ten Commandments. But Henry Wilcoxon did practically the whole picture. He directed it and everything, and it was put out very nice. So I liked him. I saw him. He was a very, he was a, I'd go call him a gent gentleman personified, the old European gentleman. But he was very nice, and he worked with him. And that's about it. I can think I can't think much you, more. You mentioned uh, that uh, you uh, did a show in the Hollywood Bowl once. And you didn't, oh, yes. And your paycheck wasn't quite what you thought <laughs> it should be. Well, I did the chorus in Carmen. And Carmen was a beautiful production. We'd come down behind the hills to the Hollywood Bowl. And I worked the whole week on the rehearsal and everything. So I expected over a $100 now, I think about $160 in those days for the check for the course working. And they handed me a $13 check. And I said, a whole week's work and a $13 check? Something's wrong here. So it turns out that the Hollywood Bowl has its own union, and you have to join. So they took $100 dues for my union out of my check. So I had the union card for the Hollywood Bowl. I never used it again. <laughs> <laughs> so that was $100 I got. So I said, well, Mom, I came home. My mother looked at me, and she said, she said, you only got $13 for all that work? And I said, yeah. So I said, well, I got $13. That's something anyway. <laughs> but that was the only thing I had was for the work. But that was, but I never worked the Hollywood Bowl again. But because I never got another job to do it, I did uh, some of the other theaters, the one, I can't remember the other little theater. But we did the theater in the round for Tree Grows in Brooklyn, but that the AfriCard covers that. And I thought the AfriCard, which covers the stage and the TV work, would cover that, but it didn't. But SAG card is only for the movies, SAG is. So I thought that would cover it, but it never did. So I said, oh, well, I'm not going to work that 
the Hollywood Bowl again. But then this picture, do you want to say how it came about? Yeah, well, you got it. Talk okay. about Jimmy Dean. Okay. Well, we knew Jimmy okay. Dean when he was a young boy in, in New York. Our family did. My mother knew him quite well. And uh, he got into the business, but he moved when his aunt took him to Indiana to live after his mother died. We didn't see him for years and years after that. But my mother had a secret little name he used, she used to call him. He was 11 years old then in New York. And so when we came to California, one night we were watching a TV show. My mother looked at the show and she says, that's Jimmy. So I said, yeah, that's not Jimmy. She says, yes, that's Jimmy. So she looked and she, I can tell by his eyes. So he was starting to do the Rebel Without a Cause then. So he did the Rebel Without a Cause and he did stuff. Well, I was going with dating a boy called Jimmy Pollock whose dad did the song Diane and Charmaine, he wrote the same, and dated, and he happened to be the narrator of the races that Jimmy Dean was doing in Palm Springs. So he said, uh, so my mother said, Jimmy, you know Jimmy Dean, don't you? And she says, he says, yeah. He says, I do the announcing on the race that he did in Palm Springs. He said, well, do you think, he said, do you think you could ask him if he was ever in New York when he was 11 years old? So I, I said, and she says, well, if you do, Tell him this name. Ask him this name. I can't for them remember the name at all. I've tried to, but I couldn't remember it. So she told him to say the name. So when Jimmy Pollock went to see him the next day, he says, Hey, did you ever know a person in New York by the name of so-and-so? And he says, Lorena and Diane? He says, Sounds familiar. And he says, Well, she used to call you so-and-so. He says, That were me, Rena. Oh, I know her. Where is she? And they said, She's here. And turns out we lived exactly three blocks away from him in Sherman Oaks. And so he wanted to come over and see her. So we can't, had him come over. Jimmy brought him over. He grabbed my mother so hard that he tore her dress out of the sleeve out on the back of her dress. He hugged her so hard. Well, that's when we got to re, sort of renew him again and see him again and talk to him. So he was really nice. So when he was going up to Salinas to race, he brought the car over to show my mother and dad and me, not my dad, but my husband and I. So he said, okay. So I was stroking the car and I said, gee, it's a pretty color. And he said, oh, don't, hey, don't hit it like that. It'll dent. I said, what do you mean? Just slapping it like that will dent it? And he said, yeah, it's titanium. It's very soft metal. I said, well, why are you having it so soft when driving a car in a racetrack? He says, well, it's lightweight and that makes the car go faster. I said, oh, okay. Well, that's the last time we saw him because we said we'd go up to Solinas to see him and we were about half an hour behind his car. We came across the car when it was just being hauled away to the garage there in Charlene. That's when we found out he was dead and he was killed. So we went to the, uh, to the funeral parlor to, and his father was there and we asked the father and he said, you don't want to see Jimmy. He said because he's, every bone in his body was broken and he's practically, his head was practically decapitated. So he said, you don't want to see him. He says, leave him that way. So when the giant picture was made, that was the last picture he made, the Academy Award hired Mr. David Inerman to paint a picture of the things that were connected to his life and the different things he had. And they would put it on the stage. And if he won the Academy for the giant, they would give the statue to the, to the picture. But he didn't win, so Mr. Inman did not want to take the picture back to New York. So he asked me if I wanted the picture, and I said, yes, I'd love the picture. So that's how I got the picture that was on the Academy Award. And number 130 was his car. It was a silver spider, porch spider. It was a silver color, and that was it. And who was the young lady? The, I did the posing for that, but that was supposed to be Pierre and Jelly. Pierre and Jelly, the actress, was he, he, really wanted, he really loved her, and he liked to marry him, but the Italian mother said no. She wanted her to marry an Italian boy. So she married Dick, Vic Damone, but it only lasted a year because he was a wife beater and a music. So he thought, I guess, he could encourage his, his acting career by marrying her, Pierre and Jelly, but he didn't. And so he, when, after they had the divorce, Pierre and Jelly didn't do much acting after that, and Vic Damone, I think, didn't go do much after that either, because the people in Hollywood don't not like the way he treated Pierre and Jelly. But anyway, that's the, the story of the painting, how I got the painting. And you say you posed for that? Yep. He wanted me to pose for it.
Oh, you were telling uh, me that you picked up part of Jimmy's car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when I went to the garage to look at the car, there was pieces of it on the floor, and there was this light aluminum. So I picked up a piece of it, and I picked up some of the upholstery, and also his part of his eyeglasses. He wore this, the brown, um, I forget what you call them, the brown... Uh, horn rib. Mm -hmm. Horn rib. Yeah, the horn ribs, that's right, good sound. So he had that, and uh, I picked up some of that. And so my doctor in California bought a car, a Spider Porsche, and he wanted the same color out the outside of the upholstery. Well, they knew, they knew, and they knew I had the pieces. I'd showed the pieces to a fellow gentleman up here that I know, Doug Davis and, and so on. And so I sent the, when he said he wanted to paint the car and have the upholstery the same color, and he couldn't get it. So I sent it down the pieces of the car and I sent the upholstery down to him. I never got it back. And I, now I find out that a lot of people said, oh, I would have liked to have had that. Why didn't you give it to me? But uh, I didn't realize it. So I only have still the glass, the piece of the glass. That's all I have. But I don't need it now. <laughs> and you had some pictures of some men in here with signed pictures. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh Gia Scala, the uh, yeah. the actress Gia Scala. That's Nick. Uh, she did. I don't know if everybody remembers her, but she was the dance that did. She was a very very beautiful actress. She took her citizenship papers the same time I took mine in '53. Yes. We both became citizens of the United States because I was born in Canada, and so that's a picture of us in the newspaper together. And this was Dick uh, Nick Adams, who thanked me for the pilot film. He wrote down how thankful he was for the pilot film for the show, The Rebel, and he was able to get it. That's a picture of my husband, if anybody is interested in seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Dawes. Freddy. No, Freddy. <laughs> you want to pass me? Yeah, you can, if you want to. I just don't know if anybody... I was wondering how old you were when you moved from New York to... The Hollywood area, and how you, live, how you ended up in the same neighborhood? Okay, I was, I was about, like uh, let's see, I think I was about 22, I think. Okay, didn't, you, so you, didn't you ride horses with the Elizabeth? Yes, I did. Was that when you were younger? Or yeah, okay. yeah, that was when I was younger. Um, no, no, it wasn't. You're right, yeah. Well, she get, when she made uh, National Velvet, the studio gave her the horse called Traveler, and I had a horse that I kept down at the Riverside Country Club, and I'd ride down there. Well, that's where they, she took her horse down. And we'd ride, a whole bunch of us, it was about, I guess it was about six teenagers to go down there on Saturday, and we'd ride our horses and groom our horses and take care of them. And uh, she never had money for the Coke machine, so she was always getting dimes and quarters from the kids there. And when the chauffeur came, she'd say, you owe him a quarter, or you owe her a dime, or something like that. So I said to her, I said, why don't you ever have any money for the Coke machines? She says, they don't want me to have any money. They say if I want to do it, I have to ask the chauffeur or the fellow that comes with it. So the country club always had this gentleman riding with her. I guess he was a riding. I guess it was for protection or something. But the, all the group would ride with her, and we'd ride on the trails because they had several trails. But I always remember her. She was such a beautiful child, and she had such beautiful eyes and everything. And she had a really beautiful laugh and everything. And... After that, when my, my horse died, and I never went back to the country club after that, when my horse died, so I lo didn't see her after that. But I always remember when she died, I always remember her beautiful eyes and her beautiful smile. And that's the only thing I could remember about her that uh, I felt kind of sorry because I just remember this pretty little child that he had. And I was sorry to see that she died so young, but there's nothing. But I never saw her uh, saw her after the riding. There's a couple of oh, yeah. other men. Okay. <laughs> well, we uh, when I was doing the Universal Opera Group, we were doing Traviata at the time, we were rehearsing in the rehearsal hall, and this tall, dark gentleman used to come into the rehearsal hall in there and sit down in the back and listen to the music. And he'd come in, oh, he came in about three or four nights a night and listen to it. So finally we found it was Rock Hudson. He was making this Captain Lightfoot at the studio, Universal Studio, and he heard the music and he liked the music. 
So he came in, so we all got him to sign pictures for us. <laughs> so he all signed the pictures on that, and that was fun. We all made him sign pictures. We said, well, if you're going to listen to our music, we want a, a pic publicity shot of you. So we did. And then I don't know if anybody knows John Gary, the singer. No? Well, he was a wonderful singer, and he had an opening night at Bill Mal Malandano's. It was a, a restaurant in Pasadena. And my husband and I went there to, uh, to listen to him because we liked him. So he gave us a nice little thing. Thanks for opening night, July 20th, 1993, your friend John Gary. So he, my f husband really knew him because I think he was traveling a, a lot on the airport and he used to do it. These were? The, oh, these can be passed around. They might like this. Uh, there's a line of, they call them a line of photographs. And they're, when you're doing a show, they will take the pictures of the show, and if you want them, you can get them. So this was doing carousel, so you can take them out. These are what they were doing in carousel. Arc. And which Arc. one? Arc. I'm going to hold those up. Hmm? The camera. Hold those up. Let me hold some of those up first. These were carousel? Carousel. That's right. So these are scenes from carousel. That's the scene from If You Love Me. That one. The that song, If You Love Me, that was Carousel, but that's, that's the song okay. was If You Love Me. Who's the guy? That was Paul Cox. He was a very fine baritone singer. Uh-huh. Singing some close to your ear, ear there. Bitburn? He's singing right into your ear there. Yeah, if I loved you. That was the song, oh, If I Loved You. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love you. Yeah, that was his song. I wouldn't. Yes, yeah, I. <laughs> Thank you. And which one? Which one? Oh, that was just. Uh, I don't know what that was. I don't think. I think that was something to do with the Ten Commandments. I think I was auditioning for the Ten Commandments, but I didn't get the part. I auditioned, but I didn't get it. <laughs> I think down in there, there's the uh, stills from the Ripley's picture in that album. The, uh, yeah, there might be the Ripley pictures from that. Yeah, I'll find them for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can get those pictures and take them around. Yeah, here they are. Oh, yeah. I just showed the whole thing and I didn't show the individual. <laughs> and this was, what was this These one? These in 1970, this was the last show I ever did. I, did, I retired after that. I didn't feel like doing it. <laughs> Mona Lisa in that one. Yeah. yeah, that's the picture. The Man Who Stole the Mona Lisa was the name of that show. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, I guess that goes that way, doesn't it? <laughs> no, that's upside down. Some of those pictures, they were fixing the hair and giving directions on it. And the... Uh, I was trying to think of the... The girl that was the, the makeup now, woman. So I you were you traveled all over the world, did all these wonderful things. How did you find Nooksack? <laughs> <laughs> that is a story. My husband being born dull in Delft, Holland, being a Dutchman, he used to come up here to go fishing on the island with my uncle, who was a fishing guide on Vancouver Island. So he'd come up here, and he'd go into the Dutch bakery in Linden and order 30 loaves of bread to be taken, picked up when he came home. So he could take them back home, put them in the freezer, and he'd have this Dutch raisin bread, which he loved. So when he retired, I said, well, I thought he was going to retire, you know, either in California or somewhere in Arizona or somewhere warm. And he said, I'd like to go up and live up in a little Dutch town up in Washington. Yeah, but I sure love that Dutch bakery, and I can talk Dutch to them, and they're all Dutch up there and everything. So I said, oh, you just want to talk Dutch to them? I said, yeah. So when he came up here, he was in the first stages of Alzheimer's. 
And so he hadn't been up here very long. We came up in 94. He died in 2003, but he had Alzheimer's for the last three years. So really, when he died, all my friends and everybody was down in California, and I'd come up here to live because he wanted to talk. So really, I wanted to go back down to California, but I had all my doctors and everything up here, and my house was up here and everything, and I said, darn it, that darn Dutch bakery. It made me come up here because of the Dutch bread up here. So that's how I came into here, because he wanted to come up there. So do you believe it or not, I think I've been in that Dutch bakery twice since I've been up here. <laughs> and it's, they, they're changed over since a lot of times since the, he talked. But they, they spoke the old Dutch, which he spoke, and not the new Dutch. And so they call it the old Dutch. And he loved that. So that's what he wanted to do. He'd go in there and get his coffee and stuff and talk Dutch away to them. And so I said, oh boy, that's me. <laughs> so that's how I came up here, to come up just because of a Dutch bakery. <laughs> and you bought the house in Nooksack then? Yeah, no, not in Nooksack. I bought the house on Lancar in Linden oh, first. Ah. And then after my husband died, I couldn't keep up the house. It was just too big for me. It was four or five acres and a big stall and a big garage and everything. And I couldn't do it. It was a large two-story house. Yeah. So I was out driving one day and I went by on Pass Avenue and I saw the uh, uh, Sumas River Estates. I went in there and I took a lot out and I said, gee, I like that lot. So then I got the houses and the lots and I bought a lot and I had the house built when a mobile home brought in there and I've been living there since 19, or 1995. No, 1906 I think was when I, because I came in 1984 and there was uh, 2006 we moved. I think I moved in. Yeah. I think I'm the oldest one in that Sumas River in the States now. <laughs> and have your friends come up to visit you? Yes, I have quite a few friends come up to visit me, but a lot of my friends now are gone. I've noticed that my Christmas list is getting very short now. <laughs> so I guess we're, we're well, all about my age. You could go down and visit them in the, in the winter and be a snowbird. Oh, I could. But I got two pussy cats, and what am I going to do with them oh, when I go down? I have to yeah, take yeah. care of them. <laughs> I think my traveling days are through now. <laughs> I don't know. But I have to say God's been very good to me. He's given me a lot of things. I've done a lot of things, and I've really enjoyed my life. So that's it. And I've got good friends up here. Got a good church family, <laughs> too. I know good. that. Good. good friends. Anybody have any questions that she hasn't covered? There's one back there. A pilot film is somebody, they go in and they have a story and they will film like you're doing a whole series. Like say they want to say, well, we're going to do a Western. And uh, they'll do this Western, but then they have to have a backer, somebody to sell it to so they can get money for it. So they sell it or they try to, they show the pilot films to different companies like Nelson or Campbell Soup or something like that. And if they like it and they think it's going to be a good series, then they'll buy it and they'll sponsor it. That show will. And that's the pilot film that sells the show to the sponsor. But it never gets shown. No, very seldom gets and, shown. And did I you wish say it would. You didn't get, you didn't get paid when you You did? get paid for it, but you don't get the residuals. Got it. And residual checks are if they play that show again, yeah. then they give you a check for it. Yeah. <laughs> See, so that's what they do. But the pilot films, they don't yeah. give it. Were you affected at all by the, I don't know what you want to call it, the communist, you know, Hollywood communist thing, or was that before or after your time? No, I was never affected by that. Uh, there were a lot of writers in Hollywood were affected by it, good writers that could not write because they just, the studio didn't want to take a chance on them, so they wouldn't hire them. I know a lot of good people, and there was a wonderful director called Nick Webster who won an Academy Award for walking. Uh, Walk in Your Shoes, Walking in Your Shoes, it was a documentary. And he was blackbusted, blackbusted because he just associated with somebody who was known to be a communist party. He wasn't a communist, didn't have anything to do with it. But a lot of people got drawn into it if they knew anybody that was in that. Yeah, that's why I was wondering if you had any, anybody. No, that. I was lucky. I think I was lucky because I didn't do it. But I didn't, I was never a big star. I did background stuff, little small stuff, you know, chorus and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. all kinds of background little things. But I was lucky because I, I knew Dick, Nick Abster, Webster, and, and I knew Cease to be DeMille, and quite a few of the Wilcoxon, and they were 
very good to me. They got me, if they found a little part that they thought I could do, they introduced me and I'd go and audition for it, you know, or something like that. So, otherwise it was pretty good, that was. What I'm wondering, basically, how many years did you do this from when you first started to? I must have been about, I think my first show I did, when I was 17, I think my first show I did. And I can't that remember. That was in New York. That was in New York, yeah, uh-huh. And, uh, I sang in the chorus in New York of uh, one of the light operas. I don't. I'm trying to think of the light opera. I think it was the Merry Widow. Mm. The court. Yes, it was because I did the can can dancing. Oh, I was not a very good can can dancer. I'll tell you that. I could do it, but I just was not a good can can dancer. I didn't like can can dancing, so I wasn't a good one. But that was and I was. Yeah, that was the Merry Widow. And it's funny because I love the show, The Merry Widow. And I happened to be able to do the Merry Widow three times. And I did, well, the first one was the Can Can. I did, the, then the second one I worked in chorus. I did the dancing and the waltzing in the waltz scenes in, in several of the can. And then uh, I was happy, I did the Universal Light Operas, and then I was happy to play Vilia. And I did the part, sang Vilia, and they liked me, so I did the Merry Widow for them. So I was very happy to, to be able to do that. That's the picture of that. We did it in modern dress because we didn't have. Did you see the picture of the Mary Widow? Man, I don't know. I don't. Paul Cox, he was a wonderful singer, and he went on. But he was with the L.A. Opera Company, and he was very good. I don't know if that's in here or not. See, they say I'm upside down, aren't I? <laughs> I don't know if the Mary Widow one is in here or not. It wasn't here. <laughs> it got taken out, I guess, somewhere around here. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there it is. We did the Merry Widow in modern dress because we didn't have the old costumes to do it, and we wanted to do it in modern dress, so we did it in modern dress. Hey. Go ahead. I was wondering, the Ten Commandments, there were so many beautiful people in that show. Did you have contact with any of them, like Deborah Padgett or Will Brenner? Or no. Mm -mm. Okay. No, I never did. Mm -mm. Okay. I did strictly the background, and I wasn't, I had nothing to do with the Ten Commandments mm -hmm. until they discovered the Brooklyn accents, and then yeah, they, yeah, okay. uh, they uh, asked <laughs> Maud if she could do the dubbing. So that's when she took three of her pupils, and I was working with her at the time, and we did the uh, dubbing, and that's the only connection I had to the Ten Commandments. Mm. So did you get asking. credits for that? No. I got paid for it, but I didn't get credits for it. <laughs> <laughs> About how old were you when you retired? Well, I retired in my 70s. I must, yeah, I guess I was in my 70s. Oh, no, from show business? Oh, yeah. I quit in the 70s. Oh, in the 70s. Sorry. I quit in the 70s because I wanted to go traveling with my husband while he could still travel. <laughs> so we did. Went off. And we had a pact we did, my husband and I. I would pick where we wanted to go in the springtime, and he'd pick where he wanted to go in the wintertime. So we'd go spring and fall on a trip, different trip. One trip, <laughs> I, I kind of cheated on one trip a little bit <laughs> because we were going down the Congo in Brazil. And we were supposed to go up the river uh, and see, go stop at a village where the witch doctors were and the medicine men were and see everything. But they happened to mention, the guide happened to mention, keep your hands out of the boat because of the pir piranha fish that are there. And he said, and don't get frightened if you see the anacondas, I think they call them, the biggest snakes in the world, on the trees up there. He said, because they do go on the trees and you'll be passing under them. Well, that's all my husband had to hear, that there were snakes, big snakes, in the trees up there. And he says, you know, I'm afraid to death of snakes. I said, but they're in the trees. He says, I'll make a deal with you. If you don't make me go up the Congo, I'll take you up the Nile, and you can see any archaeology things you want to see. I said, that's a deal. So that's so we did not go up the Congo, but we did go up the Nile. <laughs> I was he, he was scared to death of those, those just mentioned fish to, snakes to him and that was it boy he was finished with it so i missed that trip going up but that's okay i saw the nile that was good <laughs> anything else anybody wants to know how did you meet your husband oh i knew him when i was very young 
my husband, but he was married to somebody else at the time. And uh, when his wife died, I married him two years later. But I, I knew him since I was almost in high school. But I didn't marry him. I was married to him for 32 years. I didn't marry him until I was in my late 40s. <laughs> your, your necklace is fascinating. What country did you get that in? That comes from Tibet. That's when I brought two necklaces back from Tibet. We were the first tour that China allowed into Tibet after, after they took over Tibet. And I was quite fascinating to get there, but it was a, oh boy, they were really in impoverished, impoverished condition. They were, they were, I mean, the food wasn't very good. I, I became an instant, an instant vegetarian while I was up there. I ate a lot of rice because <laughs> I didn't care for the look of the chickens or what or they were serving. So I just ate rice a lot and stuff when I was in there. But it was a fascinating, but the accommodations were very poor. We had very poor accommodations. Almost had to go to an outhouse when we wanted to go out. So, but we didn't stay long. But it was the first tour. They wanted to open it up. But they had a store there that was run by the Chinese government, but it was Tibetan stuff. So I was able to pick out two Tibetan, Tibetan jewelry pieces. But I had to pay an embargo, embargo tax or something when I took it out to China. They, even though you paid for it, you had, they made you pay this extra cost when I took it out of China. But I didn't have to pay it when I came into the States. I thought, well, oh, gee, they're going to tax me coming in too with that. But they didn't. But I got these two pieces that I thought were very pretty. This one, and it's got a lot of silver in the back too. <laughs> but uh, I liked it. So I bought that and the other, uh, one other piece I have at home. Anything else I can tell anybody? Well, thank you for going down memory lane with me. It was very interesting. Thank you. <laughs>